right now, let's go to the political fight to close the gap in health care coverage. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia joins us now. The senator is out with a new op-ed this morning arguing Congress needs to expand health care access for those who need it the most, or we will continue to watch Americans die from preventable, treatable conditions. A lot going on on Capitol Hill, but why don't we start right there and, and tell us more about what needs to be done. Well, well good to be here with you. Great to have you. Um, the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010. Mm -hmm. And all of these years later, we have uh, 12 states uh, in our country that have yet to expand Medicaid. One of the features of the Affordable Care Act was we created a means for covering hardworking people who are not poor enough to get conventional Medicaid, but they can't afford a health care plan. And so they're in that gap. Mm. And uh, of course, the Supreme Court left it up. It was left up to the states whether they would expand. Some chose not to expand. Georgia's one of those states. We've got 646,000 Georgians in the Medicaid gap. So I know that there are a number of worthwhile health care proposals being discussed in the reconciliation package. When we're talking about Medicaid coverage, we're actually actually talking about people who are dying because they don't have any health care at all. Can you imagine Social Security in 38 states? Can you imagine Medicare in 38 states? And yet that's the case with uh, Medicaid. Uh, it's the law of the land. We ought to expand it. People shouldn't have, shouldn't be unable to uh, access health care because they live in the wrong state. Joe. You know, it's so interesting, Senator, what we learned during the debate following the Affordable Care Act when you had a lot of Republican governors talking about slashing Medicaid. People started to find out that their mom and dad were living in homes uh, that Medicaid helped fund. Uh, th this idea that somehow, as Newt Gingrich, uh, you know, called it uh, welfare, uh, medical welfare for the poor. Right. Uh, what people found out over the past several years is it's far from that. And you have some very, very Republican hospital administrators saying, "We just can't do our, we can't do our job. We can't serve our communities." with these Medicaid cuts. Uh, do you think this is an education process that continues even today, but that more people are getting it, that it's not just a program for the, uh, quote, poor? Well, you know, we're, we're really talking about working people. I think that often gets lost in this kind of moralizing that you hear um, uh, around work ethic and who is, who's worth, worthy and who's not. These are, these are hardworking people, hardworking families. And I think about Lori Davis, uh, a nurse uh, in Georgia. She was a trauma nurse, and because she had a chronic health condition, uh, she ended up having to uh, stop serving in that profession, and then later uh, had to pick up various restaurant gigs, eventually lost her health care. Ironically, this woman who spent her life caring for others died for lack of access to health care. During my campaign, I spent a lot of time in rural Georgia. We've had 10 hospitals to close in Georgia in 10 years. Uh, and those hospitals are closing for lack of customers who, who are covered. We can keep our hospitals open, we can make sure people are covered, and we can create jobs if, if we would expand Medicaid. And so that's why I'm very focused on it, and it's something that we ought to do. We, this is our best shot yet. We ought to do it right now. Well, and, and Willie, I'm so glad he talked about, uh, the senator talked about rural hospitals in Georgia because that's really, when you, there always seems to be this divide between red state America and blue state America in the minds of politicians and the minds of analysts. But those Medicaid cuts have absolutely devastating impacts on rural hospitals in the reddest of red states. And they're the ones that aren't able to do uh, their job in helping their communities. Uh, and, and so many medical uh, providers had to shut down and go out of business when Medicaid cuts uh, went across the board several years ago. Yeah, too many of them have closed in places where they're now desperately needed, especially across the South in the middle of a pandemic, but they were run out of business effectively without this funding. And Senator, I'm curious now as we talk about the substance of the bill and what you'd like to see in it, how you get this thing across the finish line. Um, you sit in the state of Georgia, a purple state. You've watched, I'm sure, as progressives have made the case for a $3.5 trillion bill. Senators Manchin and Cinema, something smaller. Senator Manchin looking at one and a half to $2 trillion. 
What are you saying to both sides of that argument? As as you say, the the alternative is to have nothing, right? So that you can't. That's unacceptable, I'm sure, to you. So how do you get those two sides, those two caucuses, effectively of your own party, to push this thing across the line? Well, you know, Willie, when I was getting my five-year-old daughter and two-year-old son ready for school yesterday before coming up to Washington, mm -hmm. uh, it occurred to me that. Uh, this job of getting two toddlers out of the house into school is almost as hard as getting two infrastructure <laughs> bills through Congress. Uh, a lot of temper tantrums, yeah. uh, uh, a sudden burst of hide and seek game playing, but eventually uh, you get them out of the door, and I think eventually we get both of these bills passed. We, failure is not an option. Uh, we have people in the Medicaid gap. We have an opportunity to extend uh, the child tax credit, which is literally cut cutting child poverty in our country in half. We have a, an opportunity to cre create clean energy jobs. This is our opportunity, this is our moment, and we ought to seize it. So I just want to know who on Capitol Hill is playing hide and seek before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I want to hear about that, but Jonathan Lemire's yeah, well, got the I'll next say, <laughs> well, I won't make you say if Joe mentions a five-year-old or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> Senator, we wanted that, that, obviously the debate over these two bills, right now it's among Democrats, but there's certainly a focus on Republicans, and in particular, sure. Senate Minority Leader McConnell about the debt ceiling. That's, it's, even as much as the, legis the president's agenda is, is, is pressing, the debt ceiling has to come first, like m most people believe. Where do things stand? What can be done if, if, if Republicans led by Leader McConnell won't go along? What is the alternative here? Jonathan, I think that people sitting around their kitchen tables right now are scratching their heads. They know that when they have bills that they've already racked up, that they have to pay the bills that they've already created. And so that's what this is about. And they're trying to confuse and conflict the issue, but the American people are smart. They know that when they get bills that they've decided to incur, that they ought to pay them. And we ought to pay the bills. The last thing this economy needs as we claw our way out of a pandemic uh, is to send the whole economy into a tailspin. Uh, the truck driver back in Georgia can't afford that. Uh, the folks who are getting up right now, getting their toddlers out to school, they cannot afford this. Politicians need to stop playing games, stop playing games with our economy, stop holding the people of Georgia as pawns, as hostages in a cynical political game. 640,000 Georgians in the Medicaid gap, 4.4 million Americans we can cover right now. We have the resources, we have the ability to do it. And I think we have a more responsibility to get it done. Should Democrats be doing better overall on some of these key issues? Like one issue that's really important to you, obviously, voting rights. Where does that stand? Well, I'm going to keep fighting for it. Um, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here if people didn't have access to the ballot. And, um, you know, our country's come a long way. When I, I was born uh, in 1969, uh, Georgia's two senators uh, were uh, Russell, um, and um, <laughs> I forgot the other one. They're both art segregationists. Right, right, right. And uh, now I, I sit in the Russell Building because of the arc of American history. This is an inflection point in our country. Uh, we've got to pass voting rights. Whatever, the, whatever else we care about, we get to debate about this because we have a democracy. And I think this is a, this is a defining moment. And if we don't get voting rights done, regardless of our party, I think history will rightly judge us harshly, and so uh, that's why I'm, I'm pushing uh, to get our voting rights bills done. we got to get them both done. I was John Lewis's pastor. Uh, he literally crossed a bridge, risked his own life to secure the right to vote for everybody. And so ironically, he was crossing a bridge. That's infrastructure. <laughs> that's a good in, point. In, in, order to, in order to secure the infrastructure <laughs> of our democracy. And what I've been saying to my yeah. colleagues is we, is we can do both. We have to do both. We have to secure infrastructure, and we have to secure <laughs> the infrastructure of our democracy. Uh, the moment demands it. Senator Raphael Warnock, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thank you for preaching vaccine, people getting the vaccine when you go home on the weekends. We appreciate that. Joining us now, former acting CDC director, now president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Dr. Richard Besser. Dr. Besser, we're going to get the latest on COVID in a moment. But first, uh, you wanted to weigh in on Senator Warnock's push to close the Medicaid coverage gap. Well, you know, Miko, we are the only wealthy nation that doesn't guarantee health care as, as a right. 
And one of the ways that we can move towards universal health care is by ensuring that all 50 states have expanded Medicaid. You know, the Affordable Care Act um, really created incentives for states to increase the number of lower income people who had access to, to Medicaid. Medicaid is the largest health in insurer in, in our nation. Uh, but even with fe federal incentives, 12 states have said no. Uh, you can ask those states why, but they've said no. And that means that 2.2 million people directly uh, have not benefited from that. Largely, you know, hardworking families, disproportionately people of color, 60% people of color. Uh, we know that Medicaid expansion leads to better health outcomes, fewer premature deaths, uh, better e uh, economic activity because people have more dollars in their pocket to spend in the local economy. And that's not taking place. And so we need the federal government to step up and make this happen. There are many ways that they can do that, but it's got to get done. Okay, the senator is pleased to hear that. And I do want to now move on to COVID um, and the CDC and the messaging from the government. Um, some say it's been a bit mixed as of late. What do you make of that? And what is your advice to Americans in terms of, you know, where things stand in terms of COVID and, our, and the danger it poses to our lives and livelihoods? Yeah, you know, the, the, there is some promising signs. The number of cases of COVID is, is going down across the country. The number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths are going down. Uh, the gap in vaccine coverage is, is closing for some groups. Uh, there's been some terrific data presented by Kaiser Family Foundation that shows that, that among uh, adults in America, the rate of vaccination, first vaccine dose for black Americans, white Americans, Latino Americans is all roughly about the same, right around 70%. And that's terrific. It shows that if you really meet people where they are and address some of the challenges, some are challenges in terms of, of access and some are challenges in terms of trust uh, in, in government and government institutions, that you can see improvement. But there still are gaps especially an urban rural gap. There's a gap by, by political affiliation, uh, which means that there are big pockets in the country that are still quite vulnerable. Um, when it comes to the holidays, what, what, what I, I think we have to realize and recognize, uh, reckon with is that the virus is going to determine what we can do. And, you know, I hope that we can all gather with our families, with our loved ones. That's so important. We've been so isolated as, as a nation. Uh, and I'm going to be planning for that. But I'm also going to be planning for the for the possibility that the virus has other plans. And we have to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. You know, we will not have vaccines for young children. Uh, we will we may have vaccines for for uh, you know elementary school children, but that's still to be determined. We have to see what the advisory committees say. So there still will be a lot of people who are vulnerable, and so we can't go back to pre pre pandemic days. But hopefully, it will be a better winter, a better Thanksgiving and holiday season than it was last year. Dr. Besser, when you assess how we're doing as a country, obviously uh, we've come to terms with the fact that there is a percentage of the population that's never going to get vaccinated. They've been given FDA approval. They've been given um, people in their communities, football coaches, senators, who've told them that's the right thing to do and not going to go get it. But when you see spikes in places like New England and Massachusetts and Vermont with high vaccination rates, what does that tell you about the Delta variant? What should we be thinking about there? Because some of the ICUs up in that part of the country are now filling up again. Yeah, I, I, you know, what it, what it says to me is that the, the concept of herd immunity, that we can reach a certain level and we won't see transmission, is really not attainable. Uh, I, I really don't think so. And, and what it says is that even in areas with high coverage rates, uh, what you do individually really, really matters. And I, I've been very, very pleased and encouraged by the impact we're starting to see with some of the vaccine mandates that are in place. Businesses that are saying, you know what? If you want to work here, you have to be vaccinated because I want my entire workforce to, to be safe. And if you're not vaccinated, you could put someone in the workplace uh, at risk, someone who may have a medical condition where the vaccine didn't work effectively. And so if you want to work here, you have to be vaccinated. I think we are seeing some benefits from that. And as, that, as, as the activities that people want to do are limited by their vaccine status, I think we're going to continue to see some movements in that. But, you know, the New England data say to me that even in places that, that have in place a lot of controls, we are all still vulnerable and we have to take this, this seriously. Former acting director of the CDC, Dr. Richard Besser, thank you very much for coming back on the show this morning.